right, so uh, I'm going to talk to you about the high performing team. So uh, I would like to skip the introduction part about King because you probably know about the company already and the, uh, all the uh, candy franchise and other famous games that the uh, company has built for the uh, past years. So and also I'll skip my introduction as well. So what I want to say about myself though is that I uh, currently work as engineering manager, so I work mainly with people. Uh, that's my main uh, focus of this talk. It's uh, less about UX, less about product, but more about how we work uh, as a group of people. So I, I want to do a quick show of hand. Unfortunately, I didn't uh, join you from the beginning of the, of the event, so I don't actually know who is in the room. I have rough understanding of what you work with, but I want to just have a quick check so I can adjust my talk based on what your interest will be. So how many of you here are product managers? All right, uh, developers, engineers, uh, test engineers, uh, UX specialists. All right, so let's see, uh, how development, how, okay, all right. Any other roles that I mentioned, you can just, just say, oh. Managers, VPs, directors, like that, okay, a few. Uh, how many of you work in, in, in a team? Okay, so I also work in a team. Uh, so my team uh, called uh, Fiction Factory. That's uh, our internal name uh, within King. So what, what we build, we are responsible for the internal game engine. So it's the underlying technology which is used to build uh, all uh, live game games uh, that King uh, owns. And um, we uh, develop the runtime part of the engine and also editor part of the engine. Uh, I can show you later a bit of the sneak of what the product is. Uh, so our team is, uh, Almost 40 people. It's 37, 38. Um, it's a change in size from time to time because of different uh, reasons. So, and uh, we split uh, on three sites. So we mainly in Stockholm uh, and the Barcelona. That's our biggest sites. And Malmo, in Malmo, we have few few people. We have two engineers in Malmo. Uh, the King uh, Game Studios are split much wider around the world. So it's not only those three locations. We need more locations. So. We have to collaborate with our customers, our users who use our product across more than three locations. So for us, it's five or six, uh, maybe even seven locations in total. That also change depends how we operate. Uh, so um, our size of our development teams is typically small. So we try to keep it to the minimum possible uh, level because what we found over time is that it uh, helps to maintain the best kind of glue and collaboration. Also easier to manage because if you get a team which is higher than uh, five or seven people in size, it's a bit trickier to manage in terms of processes and different other aspects. So our, our development teams typically be two to four people, and we try to avoid people working silos. So there is no one-man project. We try to avoid that as much as possible. So we also have the dedicated first-line support team. So what we call by first-line support is the team which reacts to the customer request. So for example, if you imagine if you are an artist or a game developer who works with our product, and you have an issue how to I know, create an animation or create a workflow, whatever, uh, you first of all, you reach out to the first line support team. And first line, first line support team consists of uh, QA, it's a person who can quickly help and troubleshoot. Uh, we have a few of those people. And uh, consists of uh, developer relations um, people. They typically called is a developer advocate or artist advocate. So those are all who help to educate how people work on, you know, using the development APIs, or using the graphical um, product, how to do animations and stuff like that, if they are artists. So that those people, uh, developer or artist advocates, are experts in how to use the tool, so they can educate people how to use it properly to solve a problem. And we have a release manager who helps to kind of release this, and we have a few more other roles that didn't have enough space to put on the slide. We have a product manager, we have actually one UX specialist as well on the team. Uh, but we're kind of trying to figure out how to work more practically in that area. So I, I don't, I won't be talking too much about how you work with UX because it's not something we can be proud of to share <laughs> at the moment. But we, we're going to improve. But what we're working is to uh, on this uh, overhead team, I call it management team. So what we work in the management team how to build up an environment which help us to foster the continuous improvement and. Uh, create um, a culture where every voice is valued and when every point of view is considered. So that's what my talk will be more about. And uh, the way how we manage this process, we kind of think in classical you know, project management triangle. When you think of you know, you know, people, 
uh, process and product. So this is classic of, uh, of project management. What we also think of is values. It's one of those parts which typically missed out when you think about the corporate you know, management uh, style. So I will briefly walk you through any of those. So speaking of uh, product, our product looks like kind of like this. So it's a, uh, it's a graphical part of the product. So it's a desktop software which you can run on iOS and, and the, uh, on Windows and also some people try to run it on Linux, but Linux it's not, uh, um, I mean it has some crashes and uh, less, less quality level because not many people are using Linux. So this product is only in short form. So it's built for people within King who build the game. So it's not something you exposed outside. So I, I got approval from my senior director to show you the slide of how product looks. I unfortunately won't be able to show you the entire product, like videos and all that, because it's confidential. But the product is uh, it's a, something you can think of if you ever work with Photoshop or if you work with Unity um, uh, tool to build the game. So it's very similar of uh, 3D. You can think of it as a 3D uh, modeling tool, in a way. And it also has the uh, runtime, which is the game agent by itself, which helps to um, run the model you built on the desktop into the mobile apps, which when you play Candy Crash, you need to kind of build the game, you need to run it, you need to render all the details of the animations and different you know, um, textures. So that's all the, what engine does under the uh, graphical um, representation. So uh, when we work with uh, this product, there is a few things um, we, we keep in mind, and one of those um, main aspect is how we work with uh, managing expectations from our users, from you know, customers, uh, from our uh, sponsors. So when, when, when we say sponsor, we call uh, sponsors people who have um, a primary interest into making this project a success. Because we see, even if we work within King as a big organization, uh, it's uh, 2,000 people overall, it like, has different products, which games. You know, gaming is sort of kind of a product, but my team is is a technical uh, work on a technical product which kind of empowers all the game all the game products to be created. So, but they also try to think of our uh, um, tool as a product and try to manage in a similar way. So that's why we go through uh, a similar um, processes uh, to build up like a pro product framework which help us to um, kind of manage expectations of different parties. So we have. You know, those mission, vision statements agreed and published so all users can access it and, and, and take a look. We have the product roadmap. It's a list of um, uh, kind of deliverables when we plan to release um, and at what, and what point in time. So we have a split on um, time uh, per quarter. So we, we say like this quarter we release this part of the product, the other quarter we release that feature and so on. So we can establish certain um, part of the process. I won't be able to go into so much detail because we have a lack of time, but you always feel free to ask me questions afterwards. I can kind of share a bit more details of how every of that part is uh, practic practically is implemented. Uh, so what, what we do to connect more closer to the user, we do the customer service. So from, from UX, you might recognize the process. So it's, it's a, our way to um, uh, keep on the health check of how our customer feels about the product in a given moment in time. So you might ask a question of, uh, how it's easy to work with Fiction Factory Editor, how it's easy to do a certain workflow in the editor. You, you talk a lot about the workflow when you when you build the game, there's different type of workflows you can do to do certain animation, you create a scene, you create a kind of change of texture. So there's a list of different workflows you can do and we try to get a feel how easy it is to do certain functions within our product. Um, we try to uh, um, encourage um, uh, as many uh, users as possible to come and join our meetings. For example, when we do team planning, when we try to plan ahead what we're going to do next quarter or sometimes next sprint. Our sprint is typically two weeks in time, but different te teams have different regularity of sprint. We don't enforce like, kind of clear structure. It's very open environment. And, um, uh, we, tr we try to uh, get the customer validation of our ideas uh, as early as possible. For example, if you have an idea to do I know, certain uh, changes in the graphical part of the, of the tool, for if you want to introduce a new resource browser to how it goes through different resources in your view, uh, we make a um, kind of proposal, sometimes with graphical interface, like very you know, simple mock-up, you can just draw it on the whiteboard or use some mock-up with wireframe uh, tools. Uh, or sometimes it might be just kind of concept level. Okay, we have this idea, we want to do this, are you okay? Or you, you kind of 
not sure or you want us to do something else. So we take this very early because what we know from, from the past, if you don't take this early into consideration, you, you ship a product which nobody wants to use, then you have this strange expectations relationship you need to manage. So in order not to land into that problematic situation that you need to improve the relationship, you try to build up relationship right as a front, right from the beginning. Um, and but also when we do the launching of that feature, measure when the feature is done, uh, we never even if it's internal uh, product, it's around 800 uh, customers or 800 users who work with this. We never uh, re release it as a one big bang because also we know from a practice that if you release it as a one big release, you might receive you know how many issues you need to address right now because people want to use the tool. So in order to minimize the impact of risk of delivery. We do it gradually, so we ask, okay, so today we work with candy um, soda, for example. This team is going to use the new version of our engine as the uh, um, kind of first team, and we put our efforts of our first line support team to de dedicate all the education, all the bug fixing, uh, as, as long as it comes, so we can get the proof that the new version of our product works as expected. And then we move on to the next team, and to the next team, until we really kind of roll out to the entire, uh, entire company. And um, as I mentioned to you before, our, our teams, uh, the game teams, is, they split across more than three locations where our team is operating. So for those locations which are outside of Stockholm, Malmo, Barcelona, we do an activity called Deep Dive. So Deep Dive is a typically one to two weeks activity where few of our engineers come on site to that location and do courses, education, you know, different kinds of workshops, answering questions, maybe do some hacking together with the teams to kind of proof test some ideas. Uh, but basically, it's to establish a better relationship with a remote location because we work as a cross-located uh, team and a cross-located company. One of the other things we do uh, which affects the product so much is Game Jam. So Game Jam is basically a one or two day activity uh, where we say, okay, so stop everything you've been working on, just forget about it, and build the game using our tool. And sometimes we do it within Fiction Factory, within our team. Sometimes we do it with some other game teams. Uh, sometimes we do it with uh, kind of different locations, uh, within Stockholm, within Barcelona. So we kind of try to mix it to find uh, what uh, kind of inspiration, new ideas we can, can create within the process. So the game jam is one of those um, uh, things which many of the game companies are famous of. If, if some of you work in a game company, you might have something similar because in the game industry, it's very common uh, to have a game jam when you be a jamming today. So no work, don't expect any work until it's like emergency or like a bug fix, which is stopping the release. But typically, nobody would be releasing if it's a like, big jam of, uh, game jam affecting the entire company. Now, nobody would be releasing that day. So everyone jamming. So we build the game using the tool. And also, what we discovered that within the process of using the tool, you kind of look on your product differently, right? So, uh, and because we have this perception of when we build a tool, everything kind of fine, it works, you know, it works with, and we test it on a small scale. Most of the time, we have some samples project where we test it. But when you, when you try to use a product, uh, for example, for the new project you generate, you get entirely different workflow, you get entirely different issues. And those issues uh, help us to get uh, um, unbiased ourselves in a way so we can, oh, right, now we understand our user much better. We understand those people who try to use our tool to create a new game, not only to maintain it if it's already been running for, you know, years. So we discovered lots of issues uh, out of these initiatives and those, uh, this um, initiative one of the key uh, aspects for us to uh, get this feedback from the tool and kind of eat our own dog food, sometimes we call it in different product presentations. Uh, the other activity that we do in our team, we call it Fiction Friday. So it's very similar to um, what other people might call innovation days. So uh, we do it as a 20% uh, time uh, per for, 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 the, for the entire team, and in, in practice, uh, we do it tw uh, two days every second week. So today, so for example, today is uh, Thursday. So today we have Fiction Friday in my team. So nobody is, um, I mean, some people doing actual work because they have some deadline or some pre pressure, uh, pressure issues that needs to be fixed. Uh, but if you don't uh, feel constrained with kind of external. Uh, uh, um, boundaries, then you are expected to work in innovation. Innovation means that within Fiction Factory, within the product, uh, you will work on an idea which later can become a full stack feature. So for example, you might have an idea, okay, I want to um, add this uh, flag which my users, the users were, were asking me to add every single day I talk to them. So now I want to sit down and actually implement it. 
but they don't immediately be released in the same day because we need to follow the release process. And our release process is, is a bit longer. We'll talk about it a bit later. But the process itself helps us to uh, create um, the innovation required for our team to always keep on improvement. So keep on improving. And we have a list of ideas we have in the backlog. So those ideas uh, from this innovation days, Fiction Friday days, have we called internally, they later used into the um, uh, product conversations. And after a few stages, becomes a part of the roadmap. And if it became part of the roadmap, it means it will be delivered at the planned, planned time. So Fiction Friday for us is kind of you know funnel of innovation, if you think it this way. So it's all the kind of bucket where we see ideas, and then we implement those ideas later uh, when we can prove them and they, they seem to be better, become valuable. Uh, so the next part is the process. So I mentioned to you about how, um, how the, uh, I will tell you, tell you later, how, later how release uh, process work. So in essence, how we think about release process, we try to attend uh, to uh, our users' needs in, uh, as uh, fast as possible. So for example, if the customer comes with a request, hey, I have this issue, it, doesn't, it crashes, it doesn't work, we can make up a release quite soon, within the same day, it's like stopping, stopping production. Uh, but typically our release schedule is set in a way that uh, we release runtime every second week and release the engine, uh, sorry, the editor part of the engine uh, every quarter. So it's like one, once uh, for uh, three months. And uh, the reason we did so, because our users were complaining that uh, if you do releases so often, it's really hard to keep up with the changing in the problem. Uh, you know, if, 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 you, if you would have been in the consumer kind of company, um, then uh, you want to release as fast as possible, A-B test ideas, you know, get data, but in our context, it's internal product. We don't need to release every day because our users just get confused. Okay, it was this feature, now it's doing this. Because every time you release, you need to onboard our users in our own way. So we have this, uh, developer advocates and artist advocates that I was mentioning before who work on user education. So every time you release a new version of the engine typically an editor, it requires us to educate how to use a tool. So imagine you know Photoshop released a new version or then you know which kind of tool you use in your daily daily work. So imagine is able to release this every day with new features. You probably will be happy, but at some time you become overloaded with the amount of information. It's really hard to keep up. Okay, now I've been doing this, this button was here, now it's over there. Uh, then tomorrow will be like any, any other location. So what we found empirically does this process creates more frustrations than good? So and we kind of adjusted our release time appropriately, you not know, to make it too often and not make it too long. So we, you know, so we kind of find somewhere in the middle. In, in the middle, quarterly base seems to work well for now. But if our customers would want to have it uh, sooner, we try to adjust our process later. But for now, it seems to work. Um, also, we have uh, regular production meetings. Uh, so production meeting is a place where. Typically, uh, representatives from the leadership team. Uh, so, why represent people? We have product manager representing product. We have technical director representing technical part, and, and we all sit down together uh, to discuss how our teams are doing. And is there any uh, support they need? Uh, they need they needed? Is there any dependencies that we miss in hours that we need to align before it's too late? Or if you need to uh, staff a new team, or we need to change the composition of the team for different reasons because you know, people sometimes doesn't move together. We need to change the composition of the team. Um, we also work a lot on the ways of working. We have dedicated agile coach in the team who work on the uh, the way we work. And um, uh, what comes out as a result of that uh, focus on the ways of working is a um, different set of team agreements, different set of rituals. So what we call for by rituals, for example, might be team stand-up or might be you know um, making pride to somebody who done a great work. So we clap together and maybe share some feedback later on. So those uh, things which embeds embeds into the culture of your team. So and um, again, in this process to define ways of working, don't uh, it's not um, managerially enforced. So it, can't, it doesn't come top to top to bottom until there is an issue to do that. It's mainly bottom up. So teams come up with their own ways of working. And the job of agile coach in our case is to help the team uh, come up with a conclusion, make a collective decision together. You know, before in a, in a group, it's Sometimes it's tricky to find the consensus, so you know it takes time for everyone to agree. So, but in our case, we have smaller teams, two to four people, as I mentioned before. So it's easy to agree because the teams are smaller. But what our uh, challenge is to make it work cross on cross location because some of our teams are split between locations as well. So sometimes it requires uh, some support from agile coach to help them, uh, people to come up uh, to a decision. And we of course do uh, alignment uh, meetings like offsites. We do one big offsite for entire team, a big kind of gathering on location. You know. It's mainly mainly social events, uh, but we try to um, let people 
uh, work on some common uh, shared uh, activities. Uh, for example, we want to do a shared activity to define our strategy next time together. So before it was more like management decides, okay, what we're going to work on next year. Now we try to experiment to make it more open and transparent for everyone to collaborate. Um, so um, almost last but not least, so it's a people area. So that's area which I can talk for hours, but I try to limit myself because we don't have much time. So uh, when we talk on the uh, on the people uh, uh, about the people area, uh, it comes down to a few things. So one of the main uh, point of working with people, what I found, is working with everyone uh, one on one. So uh, I do one on one meetings meetings regularly, and uh, I typically even ask people to schedule one on one with me, on their, so they own the meetings themselves. So I don't. Of, it kind of simplifies my life because I don't need to book or schedule the meeting all the time because I have 15 people to manage, but also let people uh, feel ownership of their personal development because that's what I'm trying to encourage in my team. That was also what King does overall as a company. We try to build an environment where everyone feels empowered, listened to. We try to, uh, um, you know, try strive for diversity, inclusion. Very, you know, uh, focusing on that at the moment. Try to improve. Um, uh, you know the amount of uh, people from underrepresented groups uh, in our in our team in company overall. So uh, it's one of the uh, significant effort efforts we put at the comp uh, King puts at company in general, but that's also includes our uh, fiction factory team. So in within within one uh, it's uh, important to for me as a manager to take into account uh, every personality I have in the team because again I work with people I don't work with anything. engineers or QAs or UX specialists. We all human beings, and we all have our needs, our aspirations, our motivations, our desires, you know, and um, different things which drive us to come to work. And we all, we all want to do meaningful work. So, my main challenge of, uh, of mine is to let everyone to be happy, um, but still um, be committed to uh, to the project, committed to the deadlines. If we have some, sometimes we have deadlines because of the short parties, but we try to avoid making deadlines as a kind of project management structure. But uh, kind of managing all the expectation from the uh, senior leadership and also uh, uh, keeping people, people happy is one of the biggest challenges. But having one on one as a tool to mitigate, um, you know, the impact from any of the sides and find the sweet spot in the middle. That's uh, what I found works um, the, the best. That's true. Somebody bless me. Um, and one of the, the, the other aspect uh, in when you try to build a culture of. Um, uh, diverse, um, diverse team and make it feel in, in, inclusive, so everyone feels included in the group. It's um, uh, very important to work on feedback, and we as a team put tremendous effort to um, exchange feedback, to um, educate people how to deliver feedback in a constructive way. Not we don't never talk about negative feedback because it has negative connotation in it. Because we say negatives creates this feeling. Yeah, okay, now let's talk. But we talked about the constructive feedback. So constructive feedback is something that you um, want to express uh, from your own emotion. For example, um, you observed a certain in a certain situation, you observed a behavior which you've seen being impacting yourself and might be impacting the team as well. So that's what you focus on. There's one of this you know classical feedback delivery uh, tactic. You use SBI, you know, situation, behavior, impact. So when you focus on um, structure in the feedback, it helps you to be attached from an emotion which uh, affect how the message will be received. So we do lots of education in team, less about engineering, but it's more about you know, on the uh, people side of things, how you, uh, how you, how you uh, communicate your ideas, how you influence others, uh, how you sometimes maybe do you doing presentations, and you try to less e uh, help each other grow within the process. So when feedback comes as a, uh, one of the most, I would say it's the most important aspect in, in, in that um, uh, process of building the team cohesion, like a uh, uh, team glued together. And for, for some people who've been in, in the team for a long time, you know, it gets, you know, no matter how long, how, 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 how fun it's work with the product, how fun, uh, you know, how many features you launch, it gets sometimes um, kind of, you know, boring in a way that, yeah, I've been working with this for four years, now I want to see something else. So for, uh, for, for this, um, um, uh, to mitigate the risk that people live in a team, we have a um, uh, secondment opportunity. So secondment is, you can think of a process as um, letting somebody work with another team for a limited time and see how it goes for them. 
some people might want to explore, for example, another role. Some people want to move into product management. Some people want, want to move into UX. Some people want to move into people management. So we try to give this opportunity to people as much as we possibly can within the organization. And the secondment typically is three months long. So it's safe to try for everyone to see if it fits well. And um, of course, it's a bit more um, pressure on manage managers to uh, kind of maintain this process and kind of let people uh, manage their uh, struggles and emotions and fears sometimes when it comes to uh, personal individual growth. But uh, overall, in the longer term, you see gives for a significant, a significant positive result and people remain happy. It helps us to maintain the happy and productive team overall. Uh, as a company, we do employee satisfaction, satisfaction survey. It's like a big survey. We use the external provider called Glint, uh, which helps us to collect uh, the data from the uh, kind of uh, organizational health perspective. But besides that, we also do a team health check as well. So team health check is our fiction factory team specific. Um, health check, which is very tailored to our needs. It's like uh, more specific in the details of delivery, on the process of your happiness levels, whereas the organizational wide, it's about you know strategy overall and leadership and um, some common company values that uh, uh, King um, aspires for. Uh, and we work on talent planning. Talent planning is the HR activity, um, which is um, um, built to help managers um, maintain a long-term relationship but also understand um, what will be what kind of people what kind of specialists we will be needing in the, in the future so we need to start preparing already for it and let people grow in those uh, roles which company would need let's say in year or five or ten years from now so it's more like a long-term planning for every single employee uh, income and then um, uh, the most important part of this talk. So, uh, so because typically when you talk about this classical PPP, you know, product people process, the values part is always forgotten. And uh, what I found in my um, personal practice, and also what is backed up by the research, you know, Google Google did a research um, that um, in order to have highly functioning productive team, it's not enough to be uh, just a great engineer, a great UX specialist, or super key cast product manager, so this is not enough. You need to have a sort of environment uh, which, uh, you need, which you need to maintain to build a great product and build, build a great culture. So out of that research, uh, we used the uh, Google's research, we used some other researches uh, in a similar topic, and we uh, sat down and combined our own team values. So team values was um, a list of uh, shared statements which we which all of us in the team, all four of us, can relate to. And uh, um, it's, it was a very light exercise, and um, not everyone agreed to it, because, again, cross-location and different aspects of it is really harder to manage. So we, we agreed to constantly looking on the um, values of our team uh, and refining them as we see a better fit. So, but we need to start somewhere. So we started with the simplistic definition that might, might sound you know, quirky and awkward, but that's what we agreed to as a team at the moment, at the current moment in time. And um, what uh, team values help us is to uh, build an environment we all want to aspire to be and where everyone is listened to, where uh, we uh, strive for um, the place where everyone wants to kind of be happy and contribute. And uh, this is one of the thoughts, I, this is the last thought I want to leave you with, is when you um, Think about the talk I gave you for uh, the past uh, few minutes. It's uh, only one thing: it's the team ethos. Team ethos comes from the Greek philosophy, so it can be translated as the um, your team spirit or your team character. So uh, it's no matter how good you are at your job, uh, it's more of what kind of person you are, and then what kind of team you are as a as a sum of those individuals. Because if you know, you know, sum of individuals is greater than uh, you know, team overall is greater than some of some some of individuals. And I want to leave you with this thought. And if you have more questions, uh, feel free to reach out in your email, or we can have a chat afterwards. So, yeah, I took a bit more time, so sorry for that. But yeah, thank you for listening.